Now this could only happen to a guy This is like News Talk 750 KFQD. You can call the show at 522-0750 or outside of Anchorage at 888-9090-750. So may I say to each of you most gratefully... AM 750, KFQD, Kelly Lee Williams here with you this morning. Call the show, 522-0750 if you're in Anchorage or 888-909-0750 if you're outside of Anchorage. I do have on the line a legend, a legend in our time in the entertainment world. He has made over 500 appearances on TV as a stand-up comedian, including over 60 appearances on the Tonight Show, he's a frequent and favorite guest of David Letterman and has hosted the show in David's absence. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to present to you Mr. Tom Jason. How are you doing, Tom? I'm, I'm doing great, Kelly. By the way, that was a national anthem. I was standing up when you played that, that, that song there. Absolutely. That's why I played it for you. It's, it's My up. kind of town, Chicago. <laughs> oh. That's our kind of town, isn't it? Absolutely. We're trying to make sure everybody knows that. Mr. Jason, <laughs> how are you this morning? I'm great, Kelly. It's good to talk to you. It's good to be talking to you. You are one of my inspirations in the comedy world. Like you, I am from the Chicago land area. You are from Chicago land area. You are from a very rough area of the Chicago land area. It's Harvey, yes? Yeah, on the south side. In fact, I, somebody said, was it really tough growing up there? I said, the nicest thing anyone ever said to me there was, don't worry, it's only a flesh wound. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm talking about. I'm coming from Chicago Heights. I know where you're going from with that. So, you know, we ran Al Capone's liquor for years until we decided to, you know, get factories and real jobs. That was the uh, first nightclub I ever worked in my life was in Chicago Heights, was in the Golden Horseshoe. It was a nightclub that I worked the first time I was ever on stage. Uh, when I was with Tim Reed, we were a comedy team. Tim and I, uh, Tim later became Venus Flytrap on WKRP Cincinnati and on a show called Sister, Sister. He was the father and many other sitcoms. But at that time, we were both brand new and, and uh, we were America's first black and white comedy team. And as history has shown, we we were the last. But the very first time we went on stage was right there in Chicago Heights. That's Awesome. I mean, there there are some people there that are still waiting for you to come and uh, give them a little performance, Tom. I got some people there say, where's Tom going to come perform for us? And we're telling him, well, he's a little busy right now. You know, he's a little busy being a corporate MC, a, you know, a sports MC, a motivational speaker. And you also perform comedy all over still, all over America. Now, there's one thing about your motivational speaking that I saw that I had to that I had to bring up. You have an, you have you know, those testimonials. Everybody has testimonials, but you have one from the Federal and Bureau of Investigation. Yeah, I did a motivation speech for the FBI um, a, a couple months back, back in Chicago, as a matter of fact, in Naperville. You, they had their annual convention, and in, in, uh, I went in and I gave a motivation speech, you know, which is shy, a boy from, the, from Harvey, Illinois, giving a motivation speech to the FBI. <laughs> Not just to Harvey, but a comedian. <laughs> Giving them speech, the motivational speech to the FBI. You know, before you, any comedian talking to the FBI will be disappearing forever. You come out and they're giving you uh, adulation. So that's in that, in that I applaud you, sir, for getting out of the FBI alive and patting the, them patting you on the back. Very good. It, well, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> I came, I had eight brothers and sisters, and uh, we lived in a shack in, in Harvey. Five of us actually slept in one bed. We had, we had no bathtub and no shower and no hot water. And I'd holes in my shoes as big as the size of coffee cups my whole childhood. I shined shoes in taverns. I set pins in bowling alleys. I caddied in the summertime carrying two bags a day, and I sold newspapers on a corner all to help feed my brothers and sisters. And I tell everybody that's the greatest thing that ever happened to me because that's my perception. You know, uh, I, and, and that's what my motivation speeches are about, about perception, self-talk, uh, visualization, and develop a sense of humor. And I gathered all this when I was in the service. I was a high school dropout, went in the service, and got a high school diploma from the Navy, and then I went to junior college nights. But I began to read everything I could about successful men and women in our society and the world and how they became successful. And, uh, and so I read all these positive mental attitude books and then later started every now and then giving a motivational speech and then another doing it for free. And then as time went by, all of a sudden corpor corporations started hiring me so uh, uh, and, and universities and stuff. So it's become a, 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 a it's a hobby 
but it's also become a passion of mine. Yeah. You're listening to Tom Dreesen on Kelly, with Kelly Lee Williams on News Talk AM 50 KFQD. You are a legend in, as well as opening for the Rat Pack. My guys, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., you hung with those guys. You, you ate with them, drank with them. You know them personally. You were the pallbearer of, at Frank Sinatra's funeral and the MC there. How was that? I, I got to Just tell me anything about Frank. I'll just listen with bated breath. Just tell me anything. I don't care. Just, just well, <sighs> he was the greatest. He, I mean, he, I toured with Sammy Davis first for three years when I f did my first Tonight Show. Sammy uh, saw me and put me on his show, a show called Sammy and Company. And then he took me on the road for years. In fact, took me to Chicago to Mill Run Theater and, and took me to Vegas and so forth and so on. And then uh, later I was touring with Smokey Robinson and uh, Sinatra was appearing next door at Harris Hotel in Lake Tahoe. And I had worked Harris with Sammy many times. So after my show with Smokey, I ran off the stage and went straight next door to catch Frank's act because I was a big fan. When I was a little boy shining shoes in the bars in Harvey, Frank was on every jukebox in those bars, you know, singing and, in, 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 you know, uh, you know, come fly with me and all those songs that later on I was flying with my stuff to pinch myself, you know. I was looking, I'm looking at your website, TomJason.com, and i got to tell you, Tom, you are rocking the tux. The Corporate Master of Ceremonies page, you are rocking the tux. I wish I would look that good in the tux ever. But everybody looks good in the tux, don't you think? I mean, who, who, who looks bad in the tux? I can't think of anybody that looked bad in the tux, you know. But, um, Tom Arnold? Uh, well, there you go. There's, well, we're starting there, you know. Okay. But, okay. Uh, the, um, the, the story I was telling was how I ended up touring with Frank Sinatra. With, I was working with Smokey Robinson at Caesars in Lake Tahoe, and, and Frank was appearing next door at Harrah's, where I had worked many times in Lake Tahoe, Nevada. So I, I shot over there after my show, and I ran, was running in the showroom. The vice president of the hotel, Her Holmes Hendrickson, saw me, and he said, Tommy, come here. And I reluctantly went over there because I, I didn't want to miss Frank walking to the microphone. Frank Sinatra created more excitement walking to the microphone than most people did with their whole act. He just, it, there was this electricity about him when he came out on stage, how the audience would go wild, you know. And uh, so I, I reluctantly went over, and the vice president was talking to a guy with a cigar in his mouth, a big heavy set guy. And uh, he said, Tommy, this is Mickey Rudin. Well, I recognized the name. That was Sinatra's lawyer. And, I, and so he said, Mickey, this is Tom Dreesen. I think Tom would make a great opening act for Frank Sinatra. And the lawyer got a pained expression on his face like he'd heard that many times before. And he winked at the vice president, and I caught the wink. He said, hey, kid, if I gave you a week with Frank, would you want more than uh, 50000 I said, Mr. Rudin, put it this way. If you gave me a week with Frank, would you want more than 50000 <laughs> and, and he started laughing. He said, I like this kid, you know. And um, a week later, they gave me a call. Would I, work with, would I be willing to work with Frank in Atlantic City at the Golden Nugget? And I figured, yeah, it's a week. I figured I'll, I'll go work a week with him, get my picture taken with him, and... Uh, hang it in every bar back in Chicago and Chicago Heights, you know, and uh, and just say that I met the guy. And um, the second night I was with him, he took me out to dinner, he and his wife, and in the middle of dinner, he I can remember like it was yesterday, he set his knife and his fork down, he looked at me, he said, I like your material and I like your style, I'd like you to do a few other dates with me if you're interested. And I didn't say, let me check my calendar. <laughs> I said, yeah, sure, and it turned into 14 years of 45, 50 cities a year and, and something else. I'll never regret my managers and my agents always told me after six months to leave him because you could never become a star in the shadow of such a great star. And they were right. I knew what they were, the business-wise, but I didn't care. I mean, as a little boy shining shoes in bars and hearing him on the jukebox, and now I'm flying with him all over the world and staying in his home and, uh, and, and being a friend. That's the I, thing. I, I didn't want to miss that for the world. That's the thing. There, there are people out there that are in this business just for the fame, just for the quick buck, just for the... 15 minutes of, okay, I'm going to make my name as huge as possible and get as much money as possible. It doesn't matter what I'm doing or how I'm doing it. Sinatra, those guys, I mean, those, the, they were the ultimate consummate professionals. You knew you were in for a treat for a special performance when you go and see these men perform. Nowadays, you go to a concert and all you pretty much get is the glitz and the lights and you get a lot of flash, but very little substance. What well, that, that was for, for me... I mean, Christopher Morley, the author, once said, success is living the life you want. <clears throat> and I was living the life I wanted. I love show business. I love live performing. And here I was, <clears throat> when I toured with Sammy Davis, I'd sit in the wings every night, and I was watching this great performer, uh, and I was like going to school. You know, the same way with Sinatra or with Dean. I mean, the, if you would have said to me when I was a kid, 
growing up in Harvey, if you'd have played the uh, word association game with me, if you said, you know, tall, short, black, white, whatever, if you said show business, I said Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis, Dean Martin. I mean, to me, that was the epitome of show business. And here I was, the opportunity to tour with those guys and to perform with them and to watch them work and to grace the same stage as them. I wouldn't have missed that, as Frank's saying, I wouldn't miss that for the world. You know? You're listening to Tom Dreesen on... AM 750 KFQD. We are, uh, you can call us at 522-0750 or 888-9090-750 outside Alaska. Tom, you also were a part of a book. Did, now, I couldn't remember, did you wrote this book or it was autobiogra- It was biographical about you and Tim Reed, the person who brought our Venus fly- flytrap earlier, and, the, and the, uh, the strife of the 60s when racial tensions were at its highest. You, uh, I'm going to let you explain it. You, what, something that you and Tim did that no one else has done in America, yeah, we comedy were, Tim, wise. Tim Reed and I were America's first black and white comedy team. That's how I got in the show business. <clears throat> I was lecturing on drugs to grade school children. Tim and I were in the JCs. And um, it was a, a JC project that I created. And um, I it was teaching grade school children the ills of drug abuse with humor. In those days, um, there was no drug education. They didn't have drug education in the colleges or the high schools, let alone the elementary schools. So it was a concept we had, let's catch them while they're young. And uh, the, the, the program was based a lot on humor, making the kids laugh. And after we get them laugh and playing records, then to plant the seeds of uh, the ills of drug abuse. And one day, a little eighth grade girl uh, said, you guys are, are so funny, you ought to become a comedy team. And the thought of a black-white comedy team intrigued us both. So we became America's first black and white comedy team, and we stayed together from 1969 to 75. <clears throat> there were race riots all over America, in Detroit, in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in New York, and in California, and Watts, and, and besides, the students were protesting the Vietnam War all over America. The nation was in turmoil, <clears throat> and here we were going across the land trying to make people laugh, and uh, we caught hell for it. I mean, we we we, and that's what the book is all about. But um, on the fourth time we ever appeared on stage in Chicago Heights, a guy put a lit cigarette in, out on Tim's face and tried to beat the hell out of me. I boxed when I was in the service, and I could handle myself, but uh, he outweighed me by 100 pounds. Uh, so we put up with this kind of... There were a lot of people who loved what we did, but there was always that element that didn't. And uh, so we, we worked all black clubs in the north and the south. We worked all white clubs, and, and uh, we, we caught, took on the fears of America. But uh, we stayed together for six years, and finally the team went their separate ways. And uh, two years ago, Tim and I wrote a book called Tim and Tom, An American Comedy in Black and White. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, it's in, in the stores, too. But uh, now we just signed the rights to that book for a movie. They're going to make a movie of our life, what it was like in that era. Excellent. Right? Excellent. That's awesome. You're listening to Tom Dreesen on Kelly Lee Williams' show, my show, my first show in Alaska on the radio at AM News Talks, 750 KFQD. That I am talking to the corporate master of ceremonies, motivational speaker, comedy legend, Tom Dreesen. Now, I, I, I brought up earlier that the, one of the subjects that we were talking about was bullying, and, and, and I figured that this is a really good segue. You're talking about what happened back in the 60s. One, I wanted to get your your view on how the world has changed from then until now and to the bullying ex aspect did you did you i know you witnessed that when you were a kid and do you ever have any lingering effects from that from that those experiences that affect you still to this day well you know when you when i was a kid where i grew up at in harvey you learned to fight very early in life i mean if if you allowed I mean, today I don't, I don't adhere to that as much, but when I was a kid, if you allowed people to bully you, they continued to bully you. You know, you had to, uh, you know, you, uh, it was a different era, a different time. You know, I went to Catholic school. When you, um, uh, if you went home and you said, the nun hit me today with the ruler, you'd probably get hit again at home. You know, <laughs> exactly. they, well, you must have done something wrong. You know, it was a different era and a different time. Um, there were more men in the neighborhood. You know, to, today, um, in my neighborhood in, in Harvey, the, the, uh, this is probably getting off the subject, but maybe not. The word was, if a girl got pregnant, you stood by her. In the white and the black community where I grew up, and I grew up in a predominantly black area, and um, the word, if a girl got pregnant, you stood by her. So there were men in the community. Very few homes were fatherless. Today, 75% of all the children being born where I grew up at are being born fatherless. So I think there's a lot more bullying going on because when men run the neighborhood, you know, when there's problems in the neighborhood, the men of that community step up 